Olá, esse é mais um Arqueologia em Ação e hoje a entrevista vai ser em inglês, então você vai precisar ativar as legendas aqui no cantinho da tela do seu YouTube, ok? Parth, thank you a lot for this interview. So the first question I'll have to you is How old is the human presence in India? Um, well, we get several uh, sites going back to maybe two million years to one million years. Uh, and recently, uh, there was a French Indian team that reported things uh, going back to 2.6 million years old. But all of those things are very contentious and they are associated with older one evidence. But the oldest reliable uh, non-controversial evidence is early Acheulean, and it's going back to 1.5 million years. And what kind of materials are those? Um, well, in the early Acheulean, we get mostly very thick, uh, non-symmetrical or asymmetrical bifaces. Uh, we get hand axes, we get cleavers, we get polyhedrons, uh, a lot of scrapers, and sometimes kumbewa uh, flakes. Um, and then we get subspheroids, uh, cores, especially large Acheulean cores. Um, and the old one evidence that have been reported, uh, we do get choppers, uh, scrapers, flakes, uh, but nothing has come from excavated context in terms of the old one. Uh, nothing has been clearly demonstrated to be old one, as we know from African sites or uh, Damanisi, for example, or some of the Chinese sites. Interesting. Uh, and this is just lithics, there's nothing else, like uh, bones, fossil? Uh, no fossils have been found in association with these archaeological assemblages. The only uh, fossil that we have uh, pre-Homo sapiens is coming from Central India in the Narmada Valley. Uh, and then there's a post-cranial material. But again, the taxonomic affinities are very controversial, not clear. But it's definitely not Homo sapiens. And the age is unclear. So, but it seems to be roughly middle Pleistocene in age. Uh, and none of the archaeological sites have yielded any evidence of butchery or butchered uh, fossilized bones yet. During your PhD research, you deal a lot with the Paleolithic in India. Can you tell us uh, how was the Paleolithic in India? Yeah, so I worked on basically the Soanian industry, and that's located in northern India. And it's earlier was thought to be a separate culture from the Acheulean. But now we found out in recent years, last couple of decades, that it seems to be younger than Acheulean and not a separate culture. And it's more of a geological adaptation, I would say. Because the Shivalik region, which runs from uh, Pakistan all the way to Bhutan in northeast India, is a range of hills that runs parallel with the Himalaya. Because all the sediments from, of the Shivaliks are coming from the Himalaya. And then at that time it was flat land surface. And then later on, because the Indian plate is colliding with Asia, the, Himalaya, the Himalayan sediments, which came down into the basin, got uplifted. So the Shivalik hills were not always hills. They became hills later on. And whatever is coming from the Shivaliks, the rocky material, is becoming uh, rounded because of fluvial activity. So all these quartzite pebbles and cobbles, which are dominant uh, in the Shivaliks, uh, they were used to make the Soanian industries. Uh, and we don't get large enough class to make Acheulean that much in the Shivaliks. Most of the Shivalik uh, evidence is Soanian, dominantly. And this was your, your PhD research. What, what was exactly the goal of your... Yes, to look at several things. One is to pinpoint to see if I can find early Pleistocene evidence in the Shivaliks, as reported from Pakistan, uh, in better context, but I was not successful in that. Most of the evidence that I came across was post Shivalik in age. So, uh, evidence of human occupation after the upliftment of the hills. And my goal was to look for things in situ, uh, profitably datable, and also possibly uh, to look at landscape level. Uh, adaptations to see if where these hominids were settling, what kind of landforms they were pre preferring, and what, how they were using the raw materials, and how far they were transporting them, and of course the technology as well. And your main conclusion, what, what was it? The main conclusion was that the evidence that belongs to the Sohanian and the Shualiks appears to be mostly post-Echelian, and going from Middle Paleolithic onwards, and some of it is being used up to Harappan times, which is Middle Holocene, or, or Bronze Age. Um, and the Paleolithic evidence is predominantly Middle Paleolithic. Uh, there is some Lavalwa and there is prepared core technology, 
but not clearly any evidence of upper Paleolithic and no clear evidence of uh, Mesolithic or Microlithic evidence in, in the Shualix, probably because of raw material constraints. And when did the Paleolithic end in India? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, some technologies continue uh, longer in some regions. For example, uh, in, uh, after 100,000 years ago, we have a lot of overlap in technologies. So once the Acheulean disappears, roughly around uh, 80,000, 70,000 years ago, we have a lot of flake dominant assemblages, middle Paleolithic uh, flake industries. But in some places like Gujarat in India, in Western India, we have evidence of uh, miniature biphases continuing alongside these flake industries. So there's a lot of uneven distribution and overlap uh, in, in India. Um, it's probably based on raw material, uh, culture, function, and dispersals as well. Uh, so I would say that the Paleolithic ends roughly uh, 30,000, 35,000 years ago, but it overlaps with the Mesolithic or Microlithic evidence. So some places we have uh, Mesolithic uh, appearing at 48,000 and then Paleolithic continuing up to 35,000. Can you tell us about your current research? Yeah, uh, I'm currently working on several projects. Uh, my main project is in central India. So the Narmada Valley, which is famous for yielding the pre-homo sapien fossil. We're looking for more human fossils. That's the one main objective. Second is looking for evidence of butchery sites. And then also try to find out from a multidisciplinary perspective of how these humans were adapting on the landscape and how they were settling, how they were, uh, what they were exploiting exactly. Because it's a very huge area with good preservation of sites. We have fossilized uh, animal bones as well, but strangely no but butchery evidence at the moment. Um, and the other reason for that area is, is very geographically important is because it's in the center of India. So any movement from north to south, west to east, and vice versa, there should be a range of industries and technologies found in central India. So we are trying to see if this is testable, to see the diversity of uh, technology. But you have some results already, right? Yes, preliminary results. Basically, that we initially started by dating the fossil hominid site to find out if we can actually pinpoint the age of the context, if not the age of the fossils. So we got evidence showing that the deposit itself is not primary. There's a mixture of older fossils, younger fossils, older lithics, younger lithics, and a secondary context. And we dated some of the associated uh, equid and baba teeth uh, using ESR and uranium series. And we got an age of 48,000 uh, to 150,000 uh, for the teeth. So it shows that even though the fossil hominid might be older, maybe half a million, the context itself is very young. So we shouldn't rely on the context to date the uh, fossil material. So Parth, you have, uh, this is not just your only research you're carrying out now, you have more yes. research. Yes. Well, what is it about? Um, so as I said, the older one evidence is contentious. Uh, we don't know exactly when the first hominids come into India. And we don't know if old one technology exists in India. So one problem is that there's a lack of early Pleistocene sediments. If you look south of Shivalix, it's mostly the rivers washing away sediments and depositing sediments. So the early Pleistocene sediments have been washed away or they're deeply buried. So the, right now the best exposed early Pleistocene context we have are the Shivalix in northern India. So we're looking for uh, older one dispersals looking for evidence of the earliest hominid fossils uh, in Shivalik. That's another project uh, in addition to the Central Indian one. And then we're looking at evidence of modern human dispersals as well, uh, all over India, uh, Western India, Central India, Eastern India, to see when modern humans come in for the first time and how many times they come in and what technologies they bring with them. Right now there's a debate whether they come in for the first time with middle pithic technology or they come in for the first time with microlithic technology. So these two projects have going on, these uh, three projects have going on in India. Uh, and then one project I've started recently, which I'll be going for the field season this, uh, this summer for the first time, is in Sudan. So we're looking at evidence again of the earliest modern human dispersals from East Africa towards uh, India and uh, other places. So basically crossing the Bab al-Mandab Strait from Djibouti to Yemen and along the Red Sea coast. So Parth, you're talking about the relation on India with this other place like Djibouti, Africa. What about Sri Lanka? Because today, uh, 
as foreigners, we can find some simil similarities in the nowadays between Sri Lanka and Indian culture. Is that going back far in the past, this relationship between India and Sri Lanka? Uh, yes and no. There's a limitation. Uh, for example, uh, we don't have any known Acheulean assemblages in Sri Lanka. In fact, uh, the Acheulean ends uh, in the southern tip of India, uh, and it's not clear why. It's probably related to ecology, adaptation, uh, population levels. But the earliest evidence that we have in Sri Lanka, it starts at the middle Paleolithic. But again, we have no dates at the moment, so we can't really compare with Indian stuff. Uh, but Sri Lanka is more well known for uh, yielding the oldest Homo sapien fossils in the entire Indian subcontinent. Uh, now, in microlithic assemblages, they have uh, technology going back to 38,000 in the fossils as well, in cave sites. Uh, now, the question is whether these represent coastal dispersals from Africa or inland dispersals from India. And some of these sites also have beads made from ostrich eggshells. Now, it's presumed that these beads are, bring, are being brought from India because we have no fossil evidence of ostriches uh, occurring naturally in the past in Sri Lanka. So there is a connection, but very late connection with India. And can you see like any relation of like raw materials they're, they're bringing from India to Sri Lanka or from Sri Lanka to India? Uh, at the moment, there's no clear evidence of that. Nobody has tested this scientifically, but I wouldn't be surprised if we find this evidence in the future. But Sri Lanka itself has ample raw materials for making uh, Paleolithic technologies. So there's no actually need to bring in stuff, but unless something special or unique was curated and transported. Now, just for understanding a little bit more on how, how is it going in archaeology in India, mm -hmm. if I want to become an archaeologist in India, may I get a bachelor's degree in archaeology or I should study something else? Well, that depends. Uh, what your interests are, for example, uh, where you would get admission. Uh, there's very few departments offering bachelor's but there's a lot many departments offering uh, master's degrees. Uh, and they're all MA degrees. And all of these departments are basically archeology span combined with ancient history. Uh, there are very few uh, pure archeology span departments uh, in India. But most students start at uh, master's level and then move on to a PhD. But it's not necessary to do a bachelor's. Uh, it helps, of course, but you get a more advanced training in your master's if you do a bachelor's degree. So it depends on what you're going for, what your interests are, and what you would want to pursue in the long run. Okay, so Parth, thank you very much for providing us with your knowledge on Indian archaeology and all this experience, so thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you. Always keep exploring because uh, we're constantly finding new sites, changing interpretations, changing theories, uh, and giving us new ideas of how people were living in the past. Uh, and the second thing I'd like to say is never assume that uh, an interpretation or uh, a discovery is final. Uh, there's always new things being discovered, and we should not assume that. Uh, we have reached the final conclusion. Uh, we should keep questioning things, uh, we should keep testing ideas, testing hypotheses, and making sure that we have uh, enough evidence to answer specific questions.